ابي هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه قال: ولا رايت شيئا ولا رايت شيئا احسن من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان الشمس تجري في وجهه وما رايت احدا اسرع في مشيته من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كانما الارض تطوى له انا لنجهد انفسنا وانه لغير مبتغى. Abu Hurairah رضي الله تعالى عنه says that I never have seen anyone more beautiful than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's as if the, the sun was shining from his face or the, the sun was shining in his face. And I have never seen anyone more quick in his pace than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's as if the the earth was uh, was folded for him and we would try we would exert ourselves to keep up with him and he would walk uh, without exerting himself so this is now this uh, the, this is the second third of the book so the book is uh, divided into three parts and uh, the first uh, third of the book was uh, basically uh, the physical description of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam begin with his actual physical features and then things that had to do with the physical description of the Prophet Now the second uh, third of the book is basically uh, uh, the habits of the Prophet Right. So uh, a lot of these things, there's, there's not really a lot of explanation that needs to go in here. We are reading this to become familiar and more acquainted with uh, the person of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and some of his habits. Um, habits are habits, there's really nothing that, uh, uh, there's not a lot of explanation that needs to go, go into most of these ahadith. So we will read them, we will translate them. Um, the, those areas that need a little bit of uh, commentary, we will comment on them inshallah. And uh, like this, uh, we will move on. Uh, hopefully by the end of December inshallah, we will have completed the entire book. Abu Hurairah ta'ala, he says that the Prophet وسلم, one, one thing that uh, is of note over here, he says, I have never seen anything, right? He says, وَلَا رَأَيْتُ شَيْئًا أَحْسَنُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ That I have never seen anything more beautiful than the Prophet وسلم, uh, Usually what, uh, what is befitting over here would be وَلَا رَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا or that I have never seen anyone more beautiful than the Prophet but uh, animate and inanimate beings to encompass all of them Abu Ta'ala he says that anything right both human beings and any other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I have never seen anything more beautiful than the Prophet and then he describes the walk of the Prophet and, and in particular the pace at which the Prophet walked. So the Prophet he would walk at uh, he would walk at a pace so he wouldn't run himself, right? He just naturally had a very fast pace of walking, right? And uh, a few things over here. So Allah mentions that that it's as if the, the earth was being folded for him, basically. Um, that, uh, you know, me and you, if we have to get from here to there, if for us it's, uh, let's say, you know, 20 meters, then for the Prophet Sallallahu it appears that it's much less than that, it's maybe 10 meters, right? So the earth is being folded for him. And this is actually, uh, so the Muhammadin, they describe this as one of the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu is Tayyul Ab. Tayyul Ab means, that the, being able to travel long distances in short periods of time, right? And in some hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that you should travel by night, right? Because uh, that the, the earth is folded at night time. So not literally, the earth is not literally folded at night time, but because, you know, uh, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you had to travel on camelback and sometimes you had to travel walking 
and it's uh, in the daytime it's very hot so it's a lot easier to do this travel at night right um, and at the same time the Prophet sallallahu also in some other hadith he discouraged traveling at night right he discouraged traveling at night uh, and he says that if one of you would know um, what the night contains in it and the dangers that are contained in the night uh, that no, uh, no traveler will travel by himself at night so the combination of both of these hadith is if you're traveling in a group yes you should travel at night no problem if you're traveling on your own you should not travel at night and this is uh, standard for us as well right so if you're traveling um, Basically, you are the one that's undertaking the traveling. So we're not talking about you the, the, sleeping on a plane, right? You are doing the traveling, right? You have to either walk or you have to drive or whatever it is. You're the one that's responsible for your mode of travel. Then, of course, if you are alone and you're traveling at night, what happens, right? You fall asleep. <laughs> so that's, that's generally what's going to happen. So it's a lot more dangerous to travel on your own at night. Uh, you are, of course, if you're in a group of people, then even today it's easier to travel at night. Why? Right? Because lots of people don't travel at night. So if you're in a group and you're traveling at night, you will, uh, you know, uh, you will, the roads will be quieter. You will be able to get from one place to another uh, much uh, more quicker. Right? So this is, again, if you're, so the Prophet said, that he wouldn't travel alone, right? This is, and the Prophet ﷺ instructed caravans to travel at night, right? So there is no real discrepancy between both of the hadith. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he had this natural brisk walk, right? And as far as uh, walking is concerned, that's how our walks should be anyways, right? So it shouldn't take you 10 minutes to get from here to there, right? If uh, people, uh, you know, if you actually have uh, something that you're looking to accomplish and you're a busy person, then you will naturally uh, be quicker in the way you go from one place to the next, right? And the Prophet sallallahu uh, he would walk in this manner. And uh, we read this hadith before, كان علي إذا وصف النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال كان إذا مشى تقلع كأنما ينحط من صلى الله عليه وسلم He says that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would walk, he would lean forward slightly as if he is descending from uh, a high place. Now, two things uh, about this, that he would, this was his natural way of walking, right? That he would lean forward slightly. So he wouldn't hunch over, right? So, like, think of when you're walking down a hill. You, when you're walking down a hill, you don't roll your shoulders forward and, you know, you don't hunch the, uh, the top uh, half of your upper body forward, right? You, the whole body leans slightly forward. And if you do do that, then you have a problem in your posture, right? That's, uh, your, that's not naturally the way that you uh, descend from a hilltop. And uh, so this is the way the Prophet sallallahu always walk. And uh, also, uh, when you tend to uh, descend from a steep hill, right? What happens, right? You, you walk uh, leaning slightly forward, and what, uh, additionally what happens is you walk a little bit faster, right? With the, because gravity is helping you uh, descend from that hilltop, you, you, it takes you much longer to climb than it takes you to come down. So this was the walk of the Prophet ﷺ. He would lean slightly forward, and his walk would be very brisk. The, the, the Sahaba would uh, have a, a hard time keeping up, up with him sometimes. Taqannur <laughs> refers to, um, well, literally translated, Taqannur is. Uh, to, uh, to put the veil on, right? So in the books of fiqh, right? In Abu al Talaq, there's uh, the, the, the concept of al fadl al right? That what if somebody says something to his wife um, that is not the actual word of Talaq, right? Rather, it's something used to allude to Talaq, what type of Talaq takes place at that time, right? And one of the examples is given over there that what if somebody says to his wife, Taqannuri? Right? What does taqannuri mean? Right? Put your veil on and get out. Right? So put your hijab on and leave. Right? What kind of talaq happens over here if somebody says this? Well, if he didn't intend a talaq, then no talaq happens. Right? 
right? So if you just tell your wife to put her hijab on, then that's, that, that's not a divorce. However, if somebody does this with the intention of talaq, right? That the person says this in any language with the intention of divorcing his wife, then the divorce takes place, right? So this is uh, the, uh, you know, that uh, there are words like this in every language, right? So anyways, taqannu. Taqannu is uh, literally, it means uh, to put a, a piece of cloth on your hair, a veil, right? However, the Prophet of Allah, of course, he, uh, what's, uh, what it's uh, referring to over here is he would apply oil to his hair, and then before putting on the amama, he would put on an additional piece of cloth to absorb that oil. So that is what is being called taqannah uh, Rasulullah The concept of putting on that piece of cloth to absorb the oil. And uh, um, Ibn Qayyim mentions that this was not a habit of the Prophet Sallallahu at all times. It's not that he always had this cloth on his head. It was just immediately after he would apply oil to his hair. Uh, he would uh, keep this cloth on for a short period of time to absorb the excess oil and uh, then he would remove it, right? And uh, Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala who says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يكثر القناعة كأن ثوبه ثوب زيات The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would uh, apply oil excessively to his hair and sometimes it would appear like his clothing was the clothing of an oil presser. Right? And uh, I've mentioned this in the previous chapter, that this hadith is weak in itself um, because the wording of the hadith, the wording of the hadith over here, um, it's not befitting to describe the Prophet وسلم, uh, in this manner to say that his clothing appeared like the clothing of somebody who presses oil, right? Basically, that's, that, that's not a, a polite thing to say, right? That's, uh, that's uh, basically... But what does that mean, right? That means that you know, somebody who presses oil for a living, that oil splatters onto his clothing and there are stains on his clothes and that's... So that's not a, a very polite and uh, befitting way to describe the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, Imam has, uh, has chosen to include this hadith uh, two, uh, on two occasions inside his book. One was the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and one is inside this chapter. And uh, there are other hadith in this as well. And uh, that, uh, uh, for example, in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, in Aisha, she says that the Bayyaman Ahmu Yawm al Julusum fi Bayti Abi Bakr, in the Bayyaman Ahmu Yawm al Julusum fi Bayti Abi Bakr, in the Bayyaman Ahmu Yawm al Julusum fi Bayti So this is an authentic hadith. This is uh, a hadith that is found in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. However, just because Imam al-Bukhari had the Islam for this hadith, that doesn't mean that Imam al-Tirmidhi himself, he had the Islam for this hadith as well. So you can only narrate a hadith that you actually have a sound for. Right? That's the whole basis of the deen, is you cannot narrate something that you don't have a chain of narration for. So therefore, it is entirely possible that Imam al-Tirmidhi did not have the chain, uh, he did not hear this hadith, and therefore that's why he did not narrate it. Right? So the hadith is that we were sitting once uh, on an occasion in the afternoon inside the house of my father, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and somebody came and informed Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu that here comes the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, muqanni'an, and he has this cloth on top of his head that is used to absorb the oil. So uh, this hadith is, uh, is an authentic hadith, and it would be more befitting to use this hadith to describe this practice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rather than describing the practice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam using, uh, giving the example of the clothing of the oil of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter containing uh, the sitting posture of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Qayla binti Makhraba radiallahu ta'ala anha أنها رأت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في المسجد وهو قاعد من القرفصاء فلما قالت فلما رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المتخشع في الجلسة أرعدت من الفرق قيلة بنت محرمة says that I saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم she saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم sitting inside the masjid in a squatting position on his heels and uh, she says that when I saw the Prophet وسلم, sitting in this humble manner, that I, I was overtaken by fear, right? 
Now, what is uh, this position, right? Of Qur Fusa. So, um, there are two sitting postures that, that fit this description, right? And uh, both of them are, are similar. Um, so, the first one, the one that is uh, also called Al Ihtiba, right? Al Ihtiba. So, basically, you're sitting, right? And since we're sitting on chairs, we can't exactly uh, show you how this uh, happens. But basically, uh, you're sitting on the floor with your uh, your knees raised, your heels on the floor, and uh, your your quads basically are are towards your chest, right? And you are holding your legs like this, right? This is. Uh, this is the way that is described with the Prophet would sit. This is the way that's described that his companions would sit during the khutbah as well, right? That they would sit in this manner during the khutbah. And uh, either you are using your hands to support yourself, basically you are drawing uh, from the, the front part of your shins, you are drawing your, your quads closer to your chest, and you are holding your feet like this, right? And that's uh, with, your, with your feet up and uh, you are supporting yourself with your hands, or you will have uh, you know, something tied into your back, right? So um, you have uh, like this scarf over here, let's say. So you take this, you put it around your back, and you tie it in the front, right? So therefore, basically, you have a kind of a, a reclining position that you can sit, and uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the manner in which the Prophet وسلم, was found sitting, right? And the first thing this tells us is that this isn't usually a manner that somebody who wishes to, you know, um, strike uh, or command some respect in the presence of somebody else sits, right? This is the manner in which usually children sit like this most of the time, if you see them, that this is a natural posture for children to sit in, right? And uh, for a number of reasons, first of all, children are not concerned with what people around them think of them, right? And uh, what, the, what position they hold in society and whether it's befitting of them to sit like this or not, that's of no concern for children, right? Children could care less about what the person next to them thinks about them. That's number one. Number two, right? Most of us, why can't we sit like this? Exactly, right? Most of us can't sit like this because our stomachs prevent us from sitting like this, right? So the Prophet sallallahu right? They will be read in the hadith that the was sallam, that his stomach and his chest were in line with one another, right? So therefore, he was able to sit like this even in his uh, in his fifties, right? So this is this is the second reason why the Prophet sallallahu was able to sit like this, and the third reason that this is the way of sitting of a simple, humble person, right? Uh, a humble person. This is the way that uh, somebody who doesn't have, uh, uh, you know, who doesn't have the slightest bit of arrogance. This is the person that will sit like this in a gathering, right? Somebody who is who is not concerned with uh, uh, with uh, a display of arrogance. So the, this is why Qayla uh, bin Tumakhrama says that al mutakhshia fi al right? Al mutakhshia fi al is somebody khushur means uh, humility, right? This is. I saw him sitting in this humble manner, and this struck fear into my heart, right? And that this is the way that the Prophet sallallahu is sitting. And addition, in addition to this, one, one thing else that this tells you is that uh, you know, this was not the time of salah, by the way, right? Because uh, the Prophet sallallahu at salah time, he would come at the time of salah to the masjid. So, so many ahadith, this is described, that when the time of salah came, the Prophet ﷺ would enter the masjid and go straight to leave the salah. And after the salah is finished, he would leave, right? He would turn around and then he would leave, right? Um, so this is on another occasion when the Prophet ﷺ was just sitting inside the masjid. And it appears that he was sitting on his own, right? Uh, so what this hadith tells you is that women in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they had access to the masjid. That's why Layla bin Zubakhrama, she was able to go inside and see the Prophet sallallahu right? And if this was not the case, then how is it possible that she is narrating herself that she saw the Prophet sallallahu sitting like this? So the, the very first thing this tells you is that in the time of the Prophet sallallahu women did have access to the masjid. And, you know, as far as the women and the access to the masjid is concerned, the Prophet sallallahu he made it clear, لا تمنعوا إِمَاءَ اللَّهِ مِنْ مَسَاجِدِ اللَّهِ Don't 
uh, stops the, the, the bonds women of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from entering the masjid. However, at the same time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also narrated to have said that the best salah of the woman is the salah that she performs inside her home and the middle room of her home is better for her than the, the outs the room that is on uh, the outer perimeter of her home. So in the combination of both of these hadiths, so the first thing that we understand is if somebody wants to come to the masjid, nobody has the right to stop her from coming to the masjid. However, for regular salah, for normal everyday salah, it is, uh, it is preferable and it is more rewarding for a woman to perform her salah inside her home. Right? It is for men, it is a matter of virtue to come to the masjid to perform your salat in congregation. For women, it is permissible, there is nothing wrong with this, and the hadith is quite explicit and clear. However, the hadith are also clear in this fact, to do justice to this, that the salah of a woman inside her home is more virtuous than the salah that she performs inside congregations. Right? So the, the, permission, the permission to come to the masjid exists, however, the virtue of performing salah inside the home also exists and this is for salah by the way right so for gatherings of knowledge like this one so to learn something then that rule does not apply right that you learn inside your home and you don't come to the masjid this is specifically talking about salah right the congregational salah that the salah of the woman inside her home is more virtuous than the salah inside the masjid however if she wishes to come to the masjid then she will be permitted to come to the masjid and nobody has the right to stop her right and uh, أن عباد بن تميم من عمي أن رأى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مستلقيا في المسجد واضع إحدى رجليه على الأخرى. عباد بن تميم says that he saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم or he narrates from his uncle that he saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم lying down inside the masjid right with one foot on top of the other right or one leg on top of the other. so basically the general the general way that the Prophet slept, we all know he slept on his right side with his hand underneath his right uh, cheek and uh, that's how the Prophet slept. However, uh, when the Prophet on occasion he did also um, sleep on his back, right? That is what is being referred to over here. And uh, there are those narrations where the Prophet he, uh, he discouraged sleeping in this manner, right? He discouraged sleeping on the back with one foot on top of the other. Why, right? So the reason for that discouragement of sleeping with one foot on top of the other uh, while lying on your back is because we, we read the description of the clothing that was worn in the time of the Prophet right? So it was generally an open uh, clothing. So it's much easier, uh, or it's, it's, it's highly likely that if somebody is sleeping in that manner, that their awa could become exposed, right? If they're just sleeping uh, with, with their feet straight, and they're wearing an open piece of uh, clothing at the bottom, and it's more unlikely for that to happen if they're sleeping on their side. However, if this fear doesn't exist, then there is nothing wrong with sleeping uh, just lying on your back. So in general, it appears from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, that at night he would sleep on his right side. So when he would intend to sleep for a prolonged period of time, he would sleep on his right side. And when he would uh, you know, sleep uh, just in the afternoon, for example, it is the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to take a short rest, right? Now, in, in Arabic it's called Qaylul. That's Qayluda, the word Qilla is right in there, right? <laughs> so it's not the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sleep for three hours in the afternoon, right? So that's not Qilla, right? Some of us, we, we misuse this sunnah, right? That if you sleep for two hours in the afternoon, and if your wife wants you to wake up, you're saying sunnah to sleep in the afternoon, right? So it's, it's not sunnah to sleep for two hours in the afternoon. Tilla is you know, soon enough for sleep to sleep for a short while in the afternoon. Just basically rest for a little while, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Just lie down and close your eyes, and that's what Tayyula is. Right? So this is we know this because the Prophet he did this sometimes just shortly before the salah was about to begin, or sometimes shortly after. Right? So he didn't sleep for a prolonged period of time in the afternoon. That, that defeats the whole purpose. Right? 
So because, I'll tell you why, the Prophet encouraged us to go to sleep very soon after Isha. Right? If possible, immediately after Isha. You pray Isha, you go home, you go to sleep. Right? That's, that's generally the, the understanding, and that's generally what should be done. There are very few exceptions to this. Uh, one is the one that we're doing right now, that it is permissible and it is encouraged to convene in gatherings of knowledge yeah. after Salat al Isha. It's also encouraged to spend time with your family after Isha. What's discouraged is going and spending time here and about after Isha. If you have nothing better to do, go home and go to sleep. Now, do you think somebody who slept for three hours in the afternoon is going to be able to get to sleep right after Isha? Right? Unless you have, you can really sleep a lot, like most regular people can't do that, right? If you sleep for two hours in the afternoon, you're not going to be able to sleep right after Isha. So the afternoon is a nap, right? A short one. And generally speaking, anything that is above 30 minutes, right? So we know from science, right? That anything that is above 30 minutes, now you're going to enter into a deeper stage of sleep. So you don't want to enter that deeper stage of sleep in the afternoon, you just want to stay in the first stage, right? So maximum 30 minutes, preferably even less than that. That is... He would sleep on his back in the afternoon, right? And uh, on his uh, side uh, when he would sleep for a long period of time. And... Uh, because uh, generally speaking, it's, it's actually easier to fall asleep when you are... Uh, uh, so initially, when you are tired, you want to... Basically, the, the point of sleeping in the afternoon is not actually to go to sleep, right? It's to rest the, uh, you know, your body, right? So you don't... It's... Uh, you know, in Urdu, they say, kamar right? So literally, that means that, you know, to straighten your back. So you lie on your, your back and you straighten it for a little while. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا جلس في المسجد احتبى بيديه. When he would sleep inside, when he would sit inside the masjid, he would hold his 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 legs and he would walk them with his hands, just like the way that I just mentioned a little while ago. بعد ما جاء في توك أتي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and the leaning of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ra'aytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muttakiyan ala wasadatin ala yasarim Jabir bin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting and he was leaning on a pillow um, on, his, uh, on his left, right? So um, this is the hadith, right? So uh, all of these things, right? So this is just mention of some of the habits of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pretty self-explanatory, the Prophet was sitting and it was his habit that when he's sitting in a gathering that he would lean on a pillow and uh, sometimes he would lean on his right, sometimes he would lean on his left. The, the companions, they are just describing what they saw of the Prophet so as to convey that to the future generations. Right? And uh, the Prophet uh, he is narrated to have said, right? أن أبي جحيفة قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما أنا فلا أكل متكيا. That uh, as for me, I do not eat while I am leaning. Right? This was what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said. Now there is an interesting discussion over here as to what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم meant over here and why it is why he did not eat when he was leaning. So the first thing over here is: Is it haram to eat when you're leaning? So it's not exactly haram to eat when you're leaning, right? So that's uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, I don't do this. That doesn't necessarily mean it's haram. However, because the Prophet ﷺ is not doing this, there is definitely some significance to not doing this, right? Um, there are a few things over here. First of all, food is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So when you are leaning and you know reclining position and like you know most people eat in front of their TVs in this manner, right? And uh, you know that takes away from the bounty of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That is, you know, you're tr you're not treating this with the respect it deserves. This is a gift from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and you're sitting here leaning back and you know throwing it into your mouth like this, and that's that's not befitting of somebody who is receiving a gift, right? So you know if you are coming and presenting me with a gift, and I say. Oh, that's how would you feel, right? 
I, I didn't even get up to receive your gift from you. <laughs> right? And this, that's, uh, I'm just sitting here leaning, and you know, maybe I have my legs up here, and you came and gave me something like that. <laughs> so, so that's, that's not the way that a gift is received, right? And that's not a way that you would honor uh, a gift that is given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing is uh, that when, so th this is the first and most important one. And the second is, this is the way that um, the people of arrogance, they eat, right? So, you know, this is, uh, they eat in this manner, right? Uh, that um, they, they lean and, uh, and basically they are uh, engaged in some sort of uh, amusement or whatever it is that they're doing, and uh, they are eating at the same time. The third thing over here is the, the status of eating in itself, right? Why do we eat? Right? So some people eat just for the sake of eating, right? and other people, like you and I, we are supposed to eat for the sake of nourishing and sustaining ourselves. Right? So eating in itself is not supposed to be something that you, you know, that requires some excessive preparation on your part, and then you know you you sit and you know that that becomes an ordeal in itself. Right? You eat that the biqadri ma yakumna bihi sulb. Right? How did the Prophet ﷺ eat? That he would eat as much as he was able to sustain himself, right? And uh, um, we often hear people say that, you know, it is sunnah to divide your stomach into three parts, right? And that uh, uh, one part for food, one part for water, and one part for air, that's not sunnah. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ, what he said is بِحَسْبِ بْنِ آدَمْ لُقَيْمَاتِ يَقُمْنَ بِهِ صُلْبُ That it is enough for the son of Adam to eat a few morsels of food to keep his back straight, right? But if you must, right? If you must, if you're a person who really enjoys food, then you divide your stomach into three. So it's not general advice for every single person that this is the way that you should be eating every single day, right? This is, if you must eat, then you eat this much, right? So most of us, you know, like, uh, we probably eat like two parts of our stomach with food and then we can just divide the third part in uh, half water, half uh, air, or that's, uh, you know, that it's ridiculous the amount that we eat, right? So that's... Uh, it's not sunnah to define your stomach into three. It's sunnah to eat that what is sufficient for you to sustain yourself. And if you must eat, then this is the maximum that you should eat, right? And uh, as far as what constitutes leaning, right? So the Prophet ﷺ said that I don't eat while leaning. So the first is the most obvious. The Prophet ﷺ never ate on a raised platform. So again, I'm not saying it's haram to eat on a raised platform, but the Prophet ﷺ never did it. He always ate while sitting on the floor, right? This is the, this was the standard his whole life. He never ate on a raised platform. So that means that he never ate on a chair, he never ate uh, with food that is placed uh, on a table and chair in front of him. This was never done by the Prophet ﷺ. Again, that doesn't mean it's... Uh, that doesn't mean it's haram, but the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was that he always ate on the floor and he never leaned while he was eating on the floor, right? Now, there are some scholars that say that even the way that a lot of us do eat on the floor, right? At home, that you eat on the floor, that is the sunnah. However, the way we sit when we eat on the floor, right? So some scholars say that, you know, uh, the four-legged, the cross-legged way that we sit, that is also a form of leaning. And the way that the Prophet وسلم, he would eat, right, is uh, he would uh, he would eat either. There are two ways that are mentioned that he would sit when he's eating. One is like the way that you sit in the shahu, right, uh, in salah. Uh, that's one way. And the second is actually in, in in a kind of squatting position, right? Literally, like you know, when you are squatting uh, in. Uh, towards the end of that squat, right? So basically the only contact you have with your with the floor is uh, your feet, right? So a lot of us, a lot of we can't even squat, right? <laughs> on, on a regular occasion, forget about actually eating in this manner, right? So you know what this does, right? So how long can a, a regular person squat for? If you're a really, really, really healthy person, maybe a couple of minutes, right? So that's how much time it would take the Prophet to eat, right? So that's, that's basically it. That's how long it will take him to eat. He 
you would sit in this manner and you would eat and that's it, he's finished, right? That's, that was the meal of the Prophet And one additional thing that's going to happen is if you're squatting, what's going to happen? It's impossible that, you, you know, if you eat every day in a squatting position, that you will have a stomach. Right? That's just not possible. That it just doesn't fit anatomically. Right? <laughs> if, you have, if you're eating in that position and you also have a gut, Right? That's that's just not going to happen, right? That's so that's uh, you know this was uh, the attitude of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as far as food was concerned. And the last thing that we will read over here, Bab al Majah fi Ittikai Rasulillahi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the chapter concerning the leading of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the previous chapter was the leading of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. But however, that was in a sitting position. The leading of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's been described over here is when uh, he is in a standing position. So the only time this happened was uh, when the Prophet sallallahu was going through his final sickness, uh, the sickness in which he passed away. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ibn Zayd wa alayhi thawbun qitubiyun qad tawashaha bihi fa salla bihi. Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala who says, that the Prophet وسلم, he was he was feeling ill and he uh, he came out of his home leaning on Usama bin Zayd leaning on Usama bin Zayd and he was wearing a loose cotton garment that he had uh, put around himself and he led them in prayer. This was one of the last times that the Prophet وسلم, he led the people in prayer. There's another hadith of uh, Fatha bin Abbas that he came out leaning on him. Uh, so basically in the final illness of the Prophet وسلم, which lasted uh, a number of days but the, the actual uh, pinnacle of that illness lasted about five days. Right? Uh, the Prophet وسلم, so it lasted about two weeks in total but the, the, the series the portion of that illness was about five days, the final five days of the life of the Prophet sallallahu He entered the masjid about three or four times, and each time he entered, he was leaning on either uh, Usama bin Zayd, Ali radiallahu ta'ala, followed bin Abbas. Uh, these were the companions that were, uh, uh, first of all, they were relatives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and uh, he, he used them for support when he was coming into the masjid. Again, this is... Uh, uh, there's, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? That doesn't mean it's soon enough for you to come into the masjid and to read against the person next to you. Right? This was done because uh, this was the illness of the Prophet sallallahu This is something that the companions, they witnessed happening. And uh, one thing that you see over here is that up until the very end, the Prophet sallallahu so long as it was possible for him, he did come to the masjid. Right? He did come to the masjid uh, to, uh, to lead the salah. On one occasion uh, uh, for Isha Salah, right, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made wudu and he fainted, he made wudu again and he fainted, he made wudu again. Three times and he kept asking whether the people have prayed and he, he was informed that no, they have not prayed, they are waiting for you, right? And finally, when he was not able to go to the masjid, he, he instructed Sayyidina Bukhara Allah Ta'ala to go and uh, lead the people in their prayer. And these uh, last few days of the life of the Prophet 